أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد Brothers and sisters, um, just a quick message, inshallah. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, created as, as a human species that by its very nature cannot exist solitarily. We can't exist as individuals on our own. We are wired naturally, we've been created to live uh, you know, in groups, in jama'at, in families, in societies, uh, etc. We are a social species. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us our deen and built the deen on that basic fitra. On, that, on this very same nature uh, is embedded in our deen. And for that reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, called us an ummah. Uh, and Ummah, uh, you know, the word Ummah comes from Um, it comes from Mother, right? Um, in the sense that the way, uh, you know, a mother is fundamental to the family unit, our Ummahood, the idea that we are an Ummah is fundamental to, uh, to our identity, but also to our ability to function effectively as a people. That means that anything uh, that happens to us, um, it happens, when it happens to one of us, it happens to all of us. When it happens to all of us, it happens to every single individual. It, 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 it's collective. We move collectively as a jama'ah. Right? So when things happen positively, we progress positively. It's because we will do things collectively, positive change will happen. And when things uh, go bad, it's because collectively, collectively we have begun to decline as an ummah, as a whole. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam declares that Allah's hand is with the jama'ah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us uh, that we are uh, the best of, uh, we are the best of ummahs, the best of nations. Why? Because we take collective responsibility for ourselves. And that collective responsibility is al-amru bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar. Uh, the Prophet tells us that we are like a body. When one part of the body uh, feels uh, pain, uh, then the rest of the body also suffers with fever and sleeplessness. So constantly, the Prophet described us as, as, uh, as a building. One part of the building, each brick in the building supports the other brick. All right? If all of it doesn't come together, then the building doesn't come together. So we move together. Our, our rise is together, our decline is together. And, it's, and we can't disconnect one part of ourselves from the other part. Uh, because this was never how it was meant to be. It was never how it was meant to be. And as soon as we become disconnected, uh, we will end up suffering problems. And we end up getting disconnected in many ways. There are many fitna that we suffer. Uh, nationalism is a fitna that breaks the ummah. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 currently the, the, the order of the world is something that breaks... Um, that particular unity, uh, etc., etc., us breaking up into factions and different isms, different ideologies, and so forth, all of it breaks that unity. But one of the things I want to particularly address is the issue of collective responsibility for the Ummah um, in the area of, of education. And of course, that's, that's uh, what I work in. Generally, our perception always is, generally, it is that. Often we think that somehow um, the responsibility for leading the Ummah, Islamically speaking, the Islamic leadership of the Ummah will be provided by somebody else. It will be provided by somebody else. Uh, most of us don't look at ourselves as the solution. We will we, we'll think Mawlana Saab, Imam Saab, Sheikh Saab, etc. Uh, etc. Et right? Such and such an institute such and such leading masjid, such and such leading personality. We're always looking at other people. We're not looking at ourselves as the solution. And this is what I want to address. The solution lies within ourselves. And I want to look at it from one particular angle. We can't cover everything. And that particular angle is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given all of us 
much diversity in ourselves, right, and as well as in our children. So among us, there are people who uh, who are uh, intellectually very very strong, who Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has naturally endowed with wisdom, has naturally endowed with a good uh, with a good mind, with balanced thought, has naturally endowed with uh, with uh, very very strong um, academic ability and so forth. Other people not so much. And this is of course how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, distributes his grace. Uh, it is Allah's grace which he grants to whoever we want. And we accept our lot. But with each level, with each level of grace, there is another thing. Basically, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases his bounty, increases his grace upon us, so does the proportion of responsibility increase upon our shoulders. So the responsibility upon a person of average intellect is not the same as the responsibility of, upon the person of, of greater intellect. The responsibility of, upon a person of average wisdom is not the same as a person who has been endowed with a great portion of wisdom. And what is that responsibility to? That collective responsibility, collective responsibility for the Ummah that, that I spoke about. Right? And naturally the responsibility increases. Now let's look at children. We have children, some people may have children who are of average intellect. We know, right? All of us know this. Most people are able to analyze their children in this way. And we do it all the time. We think, oh, you know, this particular child seems to be, you know, really, really sharp socially, but academically not so gifted. This one, we analyze our own children's traits and gifts in this way. Again, as parents, there is a collective responsibility to the Ummah when it comes to our children as well, when it comes to what we want those children to be. What is that collective responsibility? All right, and what I'm specifically trying to address is this. For about, for the, since colonial times, the Muslims have suffered from this big disease because of industrialization followed by globalization, colonization, uh, because we have, because us as an Ummah, Right? You know, generally we come from Eastern nations. We have interacted with people who have advanced themselves materially. Who have advanced themselves materially. And therefore, naturally, and the Quran tells us about the Banu Israel suffering this similar problem. Right? Naturally, when an Ummah becomes colonized, it, becomes to, it begins to look at its colonizer as an ideal. Right? It's natural. You think, well, if these people can rule us, then they must be better. Okay? Even if their faith might be different, if somehow we might think that, oh, our faith is better, but we think materially they're better. So we look at material success in that direction, and we look at that as an example. Naturally this happens, and this is happening all around us. And therefore we feel that if there is to be intellectual inv investment, it needs to be in that area. By intellectual investment, we mean our own brains, right? I am intellectually gifted, I'm going to invest that intellectual gift in that area, right? Towards that material advancement so that I can be like my colonizers. This is the psychology of this Ummah for the last, for the last few hundred years, all right? Does that make sense, right? Now, we do the same with our children. We do the same with our children. We do not think that that same intellectual investment needs to be made towards the Akhirah. It needs to be made towards the Akhirah. It needs to be made towards redirecting the Ummah back and reconnecting it with the Akhirah. That that same intellectual investment needs to be made to make sure that the best of our children and the best of us, right? Because it's never too late. That the best of our children and the best of us become people who can lead the Ummah with wisdom, with knowledge, with intellectual insight and so on and so forth. Because these things are gifts, right? Today in education and in personal development, we talk about this, deb this, uh, this debate between nurture and nature. How much of, uh, of leadership, how much of wisdom, how much of you know, intellectual capacity is from, from, is from nature, i.e. from Allah, right? How much of it is gifted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how much of it can be developed? The bottom line is Allah tells us Allah gives wisdom to whomever he wants and whoever has been given wisdom has been given great good. In other words, there is an acknowledgement there that much of it is nature. Much of it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is a gift from Allah. And there's, there's an important thing associated with that. If it's a gift from Allah, Allah expects shukr. If it's a gift from Allah, 
الله expects شكر لئن شكرتم لأزيدنكم ولئن كفرتم إن عذابي لشديد that if you are grateful then I will increase for you and if you are ungrateful then my punishment is severe that means on the day of judgment we will be answerable for that portion of our intellectual intellectual gifts that portion of Allah of that God given Allah given wisdom that we have in us that has not been utilized in the right way it hasn't been utilized for the deed because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Allah ashtara min al-mu'minina anfusakum wa amwalakum bi anna lakum al jannah that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bought uh, from the believers their selves meaning all aspects of ourselves and their wealth for jannah that means all of it needs to be spent for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we give zakah we are taught that we have to give the best of our wealth not the worst of it like you know if you're giving if you're uh, giving zakah on animals right you don't go and find the skinniest one and give that for the car. You're trying to give the best one. The same is when we express our gratitude by giving ourselves intellectually to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We give the best of ourselves. That means the best of us give ourselves to make sure we learn the deen and we become the people who intellectually lead the, the ummah. And so the best of our children, the most intelligent of our children, the most gifted of our children become the people who learn the deen, who study the deen and go on to become the people who lead the ummah. This hasn't been happening for the last few hundred years. All right? And of course, I don't want this to... I don't want to explore the negative side of it because the negative side of it means that, you know, one of the implications is that maybe I'm sitting here and I'm not the most worthy. I'm sitting here and I'm not the most worthy person. Allahu A'lam, right? You know, I, I reckon my father sent the most gifted of his children, right, to study the deen. But I don't know if that can be said because he sent all of us. <laughs> right? He sent all of us, so I can't make any distinction. But, um, um, but, too many of us fall in this trap, right, where the best of our children are doctors, all right? And, I mean, for most people, the best of our children are doctors and units etc. Nobody studied the deen, all right? But some people make this dis distinction where they think, oh, somebody needs to bring the barakah into the house, all right? So one of them needs to become, and it doesn't matter if they're not intellectually gifted. It's, use that sadaqah analogy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is tayyibun wa la yakbaru illa tayyiba. Allah is tayyib, He is wholesome, he is, he is the best that can be of anything. And He accepts the best that can be of anything. He accepts only the best that can be of anything. So if you give something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like, like Maryam alayhi salam, uh, like uh, Maryam alayhi salam's mother, um, pledged her to Masjid al-Aqsa. She pledged her child. If we are pledging our children for the deen, it has to be the best. It can't be anything less. Because Allah doesn't accept anything less. It's an insult unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that somebody looks at the child who isn't particularly gifted and thinks, ah, you know, it's for Hafiz bin Adengi. This one can become a Hafiz, you know. Or this one can become a Molisab. Right? You know what I'm talking about. This one can, be, can become a alim. I'll send this one to an Islamic school. I'll then send this one to an Islamic institution. We have to change this mindset. We need this mindset to be changed because if we are going to change that collective responsibility, if that is going to kick in, then the best minds of the Ummah have to become the leaders of tomorrow. The best minds of the Ummah have to become the leaders of tomorrow. And in order to become the leaders of tomorrow, they have to study the Deen. They have to study the Sharia. The best of our children have to study the Sharia. The ones who have A stars and A's in their GCSEs, they're the ones that have to go on to study the Arabic language and study the Ulum Islamiyah to become scholars and, 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 and leaders. Because they have that natural gift. There's no other way. The, the outcome naturally is that they will end up becoming the leaders. Because they were already endowed with it. Allah gave it to them. All we're doing is just placing them in the right place. Just putting them in the right direction. That's it. Even if Islamic institutions aren't doing particularly great, if our children are gifted, they come out well on the other side. Because they're already motivated, because they have those gifts and talents. Okay? So, and, and you'll find that this has always been the case. When gifted children go in, they come out still gifted on the other side, even if there are issues, even in the institutions. Alright? So we have to support the leadership needs of this ummah by investing the best of ourselves because it's never too late. There's graduated people here who are probably intellectually brilliant. You need to study the deen and you need to qualify, develop the qualifications to be able to provide leadership so that even towards the end of your life you're doing that. 
But I have seen people do that. I've seen people with great beards go in and study. People in the Middle Ages, people my age and so on and so forth, still doing it. And they're doing amazing things. All right, look at the biographies of many, many scholars. Nowadays, particularly, you'll find many began in their late 20s and in their 30s. And we need to have the same attitude with our children. There's much more that can be said, but that's, inshallah, I'll just stop with that. Hopefully, the message um, has got through. Well, I just have to know.